Welcome, everyone. I'm Lance Earl, and this is a presentation of the Ask Your Bishop ministry. Our ministry is a ministry that specializes and focuses on outreach to the Mormon people. This particular presentation is a preview specifically for pastors. We would like to come to your church and share this message with your congregation. And so we present it here so that you can get some kind of an idea of what we are about. First of all, a little bit of background about myself and my wife. We are the uh, principals of this ministry, and together we have 100 years of combined Mormonism. For me, I was born in the church, so I was in the church for 60 years. My wife, she joined when she was almost 20, and together, from the time we got married until the time that we were saved, we wandered 40 years in the wilderness of Mormonism, and we believe with absolute sincerity that God left us in that wilderness, left us those 40 years so that he could prepare us for a time when we would bring this message to the Mormon people, but also to Christians who have a heart for Mormons and a desire to reach out to them with the good news of Jesus Christ. There came a time when Grace and I could no longer believe in the Mormon church. We came to a point where things seemed wrong somehow, and we didn't know why. We didn't understand, but still, things just seemed so wrong, and we didn't know what else to do, and so we ordered two red-letter Bibles. We just, we just went and ordered a couple of Bibles. We thought, well, let's start with the Word of God. I will never forget the day that those Bibles arrived. The brown UPS truck showed up, and it was like Christmas for us. I remember unwrapping that package and laying those Bibles on the table. And before we did anything, my wife and I knelt at our kitchen table and we prayed like we have never prayed before. Our prayer went something like this. God, we need to know who you are. We, we don't know who you are. We don't know what you are. But God, we need to know. We need you, God, to show yourself to us. And God, we will not hold anything back. God, we surrender everything to you. And I remember as we went through this prayer, it was a prayer like we'd never prayed. God, we surrender our home, our lands, our cars. God, if it is necessary that you should take these things so that we can know you, we give them freely. God, we surrender our jobs. We surrender our finances. We surrender our friends. We surrender our family. We surrender everything to you. And then we came to a point, and even as I said these words, <laughs> they were a little bit frightening to me. God, even if it would cost us our children. God, even if it would cost us our children, we must know who you are. God, show us who you are. And then, knowing, knowing not anything else to do other than to begin reading, we opened our Bibles to Matthew chapter 1. We figured we start at the first book of the New Testament and begin to read. Now, it was, it's amazing to me because as I and my wife began to read, something happened in me. It was instantaneous. I knew that I knew who God was. I was saved in that instant. Now, we were giving a presentation at a small church in Ogden, and our uh, awesome man, Pastor Ron down there, Ron Tabor, he asked me, what passage caused you to be saved? And I said, oh, Matthew chapter 1. And he said, but wait a minute, that's, that's only a genealogy. No one is saved by reading a genealogy. And I said, that's the crazy thing. You see, I I couldn't pronounce the names. I didn't know why the people were important. I had no idea about anything that I was reading. But this thing I do know. I learned something. You see, we had surrendered everything to God. We held nothing back. We said, God, we're leaning on you. We're trusting in you. We're resting in you. And then we opened his word. And it didn't really matter what pages I read. We opened the word of God, and there is power in the word of God. And I was saved while I read to genealogy. 
of Matthew chapter 1. I think it simply comes down to this. We, we must surrender everything to God. And when we do, when we do, God does the rest. Now, when we turned to God, we had no idea of what the cost would be. None at all. Through a, a crazy, uh, weird series of events, I found myself being criminally charged by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was charged. They were talking about six months of incarceration and a substantial financial fine. Now, the details are too much to go into now, but I remember that I was sitting in the ante room at the courthouse waiting for my first appearance before the judge when my son-in-law, my only Christian son-in-law, in fact, it's funny, I, when he first came into the picture, I thought, oh my goodness, all my other daughters had been smart enough to marry Mormon boys, but this girl, she's married this crazy Christian. So anyway, I was sitting in this ante room and this son-in-law sent me a text, and he just simply pointed to Matthew chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. So I opened my Bible, and I began to read, and I I want to get this right. It says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts. I went, huh? (laughs) Wow, that was interesting. And flog you in their synagogues, and you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake. For who say for God? Am I doing this for God? To bear witness before them and the Gentiles when they deliver you over. Do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Never has this passage of Scripture struck me with such force. I I couldn't believe what I had just read. And, And that passage became my legal strategy. You see, from that day forward, I carried my Bible to court every day. Every day I brought the Word of God, and I trusted that God would lead me in this. And Jesus is a big, big, big God. Because in the end, the church dismissed Every charge, all charges were dropped against me. And why are we surprised? You see, God said, this is the way it's going to be. I had no idea of the things God would reveal to me as we read through the Bible. You see, for me, it all started when I was given a gag order and I was told that I could no longer preach or talk or teach of my faith. And then one day I read the story of Peter and John in Acts 5. Never in my life had a passage struck me with such power. As I continued to read, I was blown away by what God taught me. You see, I was in the Mormon court. uh, Well, not a Mormon court. It was a civil court charged by the Mormon church because I had disregarded their gag order, which told me that I could no longer preach or teach of my faith. And so when I read in Acts 5, verses 41 and 42, about Peter and John going through the exact same thing, it blew my mind. And it says after, you know, they'd had many appearances before their court as well. And when it was all said and done, it says, and this is Acts 5, 41 and 42, then they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease in teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. Wow. I have a friend, Joe Kime. He has a ministry much like ours, but he is former Amish. And he came out of the Amish to Jesus. And he now reaches back to his people as I reach back to mine. And he believes, and he said to me one day, that it's in persecution where we really see the truth and where we really become zealous for God. And there is persecution. You see, every, every Sunday at the church house doors in my small Idaho rural town at the Mormon church house, they put guards at all the doors. And they tell the people that they are necessary, that they should, that they should keep me out so I don't come in and cause 
physical damage, violence against the children. And the crazy thing about this is that I have the audio of them saying these exact words. It's available on our website. It reminds me much of uh, Acts 13 where Paul and Barnabas, I, I believe, went into a city and they caused the religious leaders such concern that they got the devout women and the key men to go around town and spread rumors. See, that's what's going on. The Bible talks of people being banned from the synagogues. Well, I am banned from all Mormon properties. I am banned from the weddings of my family, the funerals of my family, the wedding re receptions. I mean, every, uh, uh, of course, a lot of people can't go into Mormon weddings if they're in the temple. But I can't even go into the receptions and enjoy a meal with my own family. I'm banned. I will be charged and prosecuted yet again. Dan McConkey, the lead attorney, called me one day, and I have this audio on my website as well. And he told me clearly, even if you attend the funeral of your own mother. See, my, my mom is a zealous Mormon temple worker down in Utah. If I go to her funeral, I am promised by the lead attorney for the church that I will be prosecuted yet again. But the thing is, the more they prosecute, the stronger I become as a disciple of Jesus Christ. Persecution does indeed create zeal. So we have a, a passage, it's Romans 10, 17, and this is the passage that guides our ministry. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So our ministry that we started is based on this. Now many people are looking for that magic bullet. They want to know what can we say to the Mormon people that will lead them to Jesus with closed books, they ask me, what is the one thing we can do to witness the Mormon people? My answer is, open your Bible. One Christian woman said to me, you can't save a Mormon. Well, she's right, I can't. But I have a big, big Jesus, and he can. A Mormon woman said to me once, I don't know the scriptures, but I know what I believe. And you know what? I, I actually believe her, and it breaks my heart because... She does know what she believes, but if she doesn't know the word of God, how can she know that what she believes is true? And so how do we bring the truth to the Mormon people? We can do this a, a lot of different ways, and most of them are man-made ideas and man-made schemes, and they just don't work. We go with God's pattern. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. We open the Bible to the people. I want to give you a couple of examples of how I've done this in the past and continue to do it. I had some unexpected visitors show up at my house one day. It was the bishop and stake president here in my area of southeastern Idaho. Uh, they're still in those positions and still leading the people. But they came and they eventually got around to the point of their visit. They said, we have come... <laughs> We have come to invite you back to the church. I said, yes, yes, let's do it, let's do it. You see, if I go back to the church, it resolves all kinds of problems. My friends will, will become my friends again. My family will become my family again. I will be able to attend important family events that occur on church properties. So I said, yes, let's do it. Because if the church is true, and here's the key, if the church is true, and if it is really God's true church, I want to do it. I want to be Mormon. So I'm willing, but under certain conditions. I asked the stake president, where will you go when you die? He said, I don't know. I have to wait for the judgment. Wait for the judgment? Judgment on what basis, right? You see, they have an article of faith that was written by Joseph Smith, and it says, We believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved by obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel. By obedience to laws and ordinances of the gospel works? Laws? Works? Ordinances? It gets worse. The gospel 
is actually defined in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, but the Mormons have their own definition, and it says, in its fullness, the gospel includes all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, covenants necessary for us to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. Now, exalted is, is a Mormon word that has a specific meaning. Exalted means become a god. So they have to do all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, and covenants necessary that they can become a god. Whew, that's rough. But you see, we have a different, a different understanding and a different faith. Romans 10, verses 8 through 3 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Isn't that amazing? For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do. And here's the, here's the tragedy for these people. They are told that they have to keep all these laws and principles and ordinances so that they can become exalted. But yet, no man can. No man can. And so... That doesn't really give them much hope in Christ. So going back to this state president, I had asked, where will you go when you die? He said, I don't know. I have to wait for the judgment. And so I said, well, that's, that's strange to me. It's, it's crazy because even as a new Christian, I knew to open my Bible and read these words. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe in the name of the Son of God. I told him right now, I have eternal life. I know that is my last breath, my next breath will be with God. I have this assurance. But nevertheless, I want to be absolutely and perfectly right with God. So I said, show me, show me something better. Show me anything. Show me an assurance from Mormon doctrine or Mormon scripture that is as good or better than 1 John 5.13. <laughs> they said, oh, we can do that. And you know, they could. There's a lot of very flowery passages from the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, that give a lot of hope. So I said, but hang on. 1 Corinthians tells us that God is not the author of confusion. So I said, well, huh. If you bring me an assurance that is equal to or better than 1 John 5, 13, I will return to the church if it can't be contradicted by equally binding Mormon scripture or doctrine. You see, if there's a contradiction, it cannot be from God because God is not the author of confusion. They said, huh, hmm, ooh. Will you give us a week? We'll come back in a week and bring you this assurance that is equal or better. And I said, great, that'll be fine. That was in the summer of 2020. They haven't come back. What does that mean? You see, this left them in, in very, very deep water. There's, there's nothing in the Mormon doctrine or scripture that will assist them, that will save them, that will rescue them. They... They swim in deep waters with no hope. But yet, here's the thing, and I, I want to point this out. In sharing this, we simply went to the Word, we quoted the Word, and asked questions. And so a seed was planted, and I was able to do this without attacking any of their beliefs. And this is important. When people feel attacked, they back away. And so let's not attack. Let's read the word of God. Let's ask questions and let the seed be planted. Here's another example. I went to the Utah State Fair in the fall of 2022. And while I was there, I had an opportunity to speak to a lot of people. We worked a booth there. And so we were there day after day after day. And I remember one day a man approached the booth. He was, a, he was a nice man, but he was devout in his Mormon belief. So I asked him, where is the gospel defined in Scripture? And he couldn't tell me. He answered, actually, as most Mormons do, they say, oh, it's all throughout the Scriptures. And I said, but 
There is one place in Scripture where it is specifically defined. Do you know where that is? And he didn't. So I took him to the gospel. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, wherein ye stand, by which you are saved, if ye keep in memory how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's break this down. This is not Paul just scratching his beard and saying, well, maybe it's this way. This is Paul making a declaration. So this is an official apostolic declaration. He says, I declare unto you the gospel. And then he says, wherein you stand. You see, as Christians, this is where we stand. This is the hill we die on. This is where we plant our flag. And this is where we draw a line in the sand. And we will not be moved. And why? Paul continues, by which ye are saved. And then he says, keep three things in memory. Just, just three things. Keep three things in memory and you will be saved. First, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So according to Old Testament prophecy, Christ came and paid the price for our sins dying on the cross. And number two, that he was buried. And number three, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. And after I bring my LDS friends to this point, now is the time to seek common ground. You see, they know, as we do, that gospel means good news. So I point out that this gospel, as delivered by Paul, is all about what Jesus did for us. That he did for us what we can never do for ourselves. The gospel also is so simple, so beautiful, so, so easy that even a first grader can comprehend it. We can teach this gospel to our children and they will know what it means. And that's beautiful. And then I say, but here's my rub. And I take them right to the Mormon definition of the gospel. In its fullness, the gospel includes all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, and covenants necessary for us to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. And I point out that, oh, the gospel Paul preached was all about what Jesus did for us. But this one seems to be about all that we must do for Jesus. So is that another gospel? It sure seems like it. Then I ask a simple question. If I give you paper and pen, can you make a list for me of every uh doctrine, principle, law, ordinance, and covenant that is necessary for you to be exalted. You see, that would include all the Old Testament covenants and laws. That would include all the New Testament commandments. That would include everything that the Mormon church has added on top of those. It's a massive list. And so when I ask the LDS people, can you make a list? Write it down for me. They say, oh, no, I can't. It's, it's just too big. It's too much. This is where the first question comes in. If your gospel or the gospel includes all the doctrines, principles, laws, ordinance, and covenants that are necessary for us to be exalted, and it's so long that you can't write it down, how can you know that you're living it? And they sit back and they go, oh, just kind of rocks them back on their heels. Then comes the second question. If the gospel is a list so long that you can't write it down and you can't know that you're living it, how is that good news? Wow, that's pretty huge, right? Once again, I, with, without, without attacking their church, I just simply read what's available and comment on it and ask questions. I leave them in deep water there is no way that their gospel can satisfy their need to be rescued. They swim in deep waters without hope of rescue. And once again, the seed is planted. And now I just leave it to grow. We leave this to God because we plant the seed. We water, but God brings the growth and, and that's all we can do. You see, these things become a pebble in their shoe, and, and we want them to be there. We want them to just be a little bit uncomfortable. Limp around, 
limp around until someday you're willing to take off that shoe and see what's troubling you. So the question is, who among all the Mormon people are willing to hear the gospel? We can't know. There are so many of them here, especially in Utah, Idaho, Arizona. There are so many of them that we can't possibly know which ones will hear the truth and which ones will reject it. In fact, here's some information that might surprise you. In 2022, there was a survey done. And it was about people who have thought about or are thinking about leaving their faith. Do you know that the Mormon church led all other Christian churches? One in four Mormons admitted that they have considered or are now considering leaving their church. Now, these are just one in four of those that are having a struggle now. That doesn't include those that are yet to have a struggle because there are others who would say, oh, no, I'm secure in my faith. I'm not thinking about leaving. But next year or two years or three years, someone might talk to them about the gospel. Someone might talk to them about why we have this assurance that we are saved that they can't enjoy. And they put a pebble in their shoe. So we have created a solution. We don't know among all our Mormon friends who will hear and who will reject. And if we try to figure it out, we'll miss the ones we need to talk to. It's just that simple. So our solution is the Ask Your Bishop Academy, which we have at our website, which is askyourbishop.com. I would invite you to go in and take a look at the academy. Now, this academy is just simply a collection of Bible studies that include essential information that every Christian needs to know and every Mormon desperately needs to be made aware of. You can invite people in a number of different ways. You can invite people by sending them the invitation yourself and saying, hey, I think you might enjoy this. By the way, before you do that, I would suggest that you take the class that you refer. They're short. Go ahead and run through it so that you will know exactly what you're asking your Mormon friend to do. But sometimes it's not, it's not really smart to invite them yourself. Maybe it's someone you work with and there's rules against that or whatever. You can actually go into our website, click on the Academy link, and you will find instructions there showing you how you can refer someone to us anonymously. And then they will get an invitation from us that just simply says, hey, someone who cares about you and loves you thought you might be interested in this course. And so on their behalf, we're asking you to come and join us. And we will do that and completely and totally and forever protect your identity. Now, the thing is, because we are unable to know who will and who won't accept the gospel. We believe the best thing to do is to open up your cell phone. Look, look at all the contacts there and think about the numbers that would be in these if every Christian would do this. All your contacts, how many are LDS? Send them an invitation. Send them an invitation. Invite them all and let God sort them out. I want to talk about some of the things that you can do that will help us. We need your prayers. And we believe in prayer. I want to tell you a quick story about how amazing prayer is. Before they stopped having the, the miracle pageant, the Mormon miracle pageant down in Manti, Utah, Grace and I would go every year. And this was an incredible opportunity because 80,000 Mormons over a two-week period would come to this event and you could literally spend the entire day talking to Mormons. You would, you would talk and talk until you'd lost your voice and you were still talking and still talking because there were too many people and you just dared not quit. It was amazing. But when we would go there, grace is gifted differently than I am. I uh, kind of have the gift of gab. I love to get out in front of people and talk to them and ask questions and discuss the gospel. Well, Grace is not quite that way, but she is a mighty, mighty prayer warrior. One year, Grace met a friend from Indiana named Kathy, and they determined that they were going to uh, sit together 
and pray over the entire event. They would pray over the missionaries. They would pray over the Mormons. They would pray over the event. They would just pray for God's Spirit to pour down and pour down and pour down. And so as I was getting ready to go out and start sharing the gospel with the Mormon people, I gave Grace a, a kiss and said, I'll see you later tonight. And now, I had not gone more than half a block or so. When I ran into an LDS lady, and I started talking with her, and, and oh, she was hard. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, hard eyes, closed off, not hearing. It was just so frustrating. And then all of a sudden, it was like something clicked in her. Something went snap, and, and, and her eyes filled with tears. And she started to cry, and she softened, and she heard the message. I can't remember her name. I don't know what God's doing with her. I hope that maybe she's in a in another church somewhere talking to another congregation saying, man, you wouldn't believe what happened to me one day walking down the street at Manti. And she shares how God saved her too. I don't know. But anyway, I, I continued uh, sharing the gospel with Mormons for several hours. And at the end of the day, I went back to the park. You know, that was another fun thing about Manti is... The Christians came from all around the country and even from all around the world, and we created a, a Christian tent city in the city park. And so I went back to the park, and Grace was there, and she'd already turned in for the night. And I said, oh, honey, you would not believe the crazy thing that happened to me. And she said, when did this happen? And I said, oh, it was the first person I talked to. It was just literally minutes after I left you and Kathy. And she said... About that exact same time, Kathy suddenly stopped praying and grabbed my arm. And she said, we have got to pray for your husband right now. Grace said, why? Why would we need to stop, stop right now and pray specifically for Lance? And, and Kathy said, I don't know, but we need to pray for Lance and we need to pray for whoever he's talking to. You see, that is the power of prayer. I believe that two good Christian women, half a block away, lifted up a prayer to God for this woman, and something snapped in her, and her heart was open to hear the Word of God. I'll never forget those eyes, big brown eyes filled with tears. We need your prayers. We need you to partner with us if you're able. We, uh, we have a lot of expenses. We, we give away books and Bibles every week. So there's the cost of the book, the cost of the Bible. There's the postage and, and the envelopes. We, we attend as many events as we can where we can be in front of as many Mormon people as we can. And sometimes there are expenses associated with that. There's booth fees and travel and food and lodging, etc. So if you feel like perhaps... You could help us with this. Oh, oh, we would be so grateful. I want to close by talking with you a little bit about the fruit that we have seen. It's, it's incredible what God does. You see, we just simply pray up and show up. And one of the things we do as well is we want to help you prepare so that you can pray up and show up and reach out to the Mormon people. We plant seeds we trust God's timing, and we allow God to bring the increase. One day, a man called me and said, I think you need to call a lady whose name is Elena. She lives in Nevada, Arizona, Arizona. And I said, okay, what's going on? She, he, said, he said, just call her and talk to her. And so I called, and, and we talked for a long time, and Elena was at a in a very desperate place. You see, she had left the Mormon church and become Christian. And she was so traumatized by her family. She had a husband, Dave, and she had two children. And they were so cruel to her. They were so hateful toward her that she had actually determined that that she was going to leave them. She'd already selected the date. She was waiting for a paycheck. And she was going to simply walk out of her home, go to a neighboring city, and start fresh. Wow, that broke my heart. And so I, I talked to her. I counseled her to go slow, go easy. I reminded her of the passage that talks about a faithful woman 
and an unbelieving husband and how God can work miracles through that combination. I think her pastor in Arizona was also giving her similar advice. And we made her a matter of prayer in our little church in Pocatello, Idaho. And then one day, I got an email from Elena. She said, you'll not, be- you'll, you'll not believe this. Dave, Dave went to a man's retreat. He accepted God. He is saved. He is born again. He has now come out of Mormonism and joined me as a Christian. Oh, our church. Woo-hoo-hoo! We praised God. It was the biggest, coolest thing we'd ever heard. And so we continued to pray for this family and then received another email or text or what I don't recall. She said her daughter had been watching and had noticed what had happened. And so she sent an email to the pastor. And, he, and she said, I, I don't know what has happened with my dad. I don't understand what I'm seeing in him. But she said, whatever he has, I want it. <laughs> the whole family was scheduled to be baptized and our church went, Woo-hoo! wow, amazing. Oh, that's so incredible. We were so excited. I was invited to go down and we, we weren't able to go down and attend their baptism, but oh, we celebrated with them and we're still in contact. There's another man. He lives in my community and I have been sworn to secrecy, so I won't share even his first name. But from the moment I left The church, he was so aggressive against me. He was a devout Mormon. And then after this last general conference, he heard something that troubled him so deeply that he sent me a text and asked a question, and I just answered it. thought, wow, this is different. And then another text came and another question, and they started coming rapid fire. And pretty soon I realized, oh, he's having a crisis of his faith. I responded to one of his texts and I said, hey, you know, Grace, as it turns out, is making her world famous stuffed peppers tonight. They're amazing. And we would like you to come to dinner. At first he declined, but half an hour later he called up and he said, hey, is is the invitation for dinner still open? He came and we talked and enjoyed a meal. And he has indicated that he would like to, when his schedule allows Join with me once or twice a week and read the book of John. Praise the Lord. Another man supported me in 2014 when I ran for the state legislature. Good man, good Mormon, decent man, kind man. I had tried to talk with him and he would have nothing to do with me. So I kind of put him on the back burner and moved on. Recently, he called me. He said, hey, can we have lunch? I said, hey, you bet we can. So we're talking, and he has pretty much convinced himself that the gospel, as Paul taught it, is the truth, and the gospel, as the church teaches it, has some problems. Well, he's still kind of hung up on a few things in the Mormon church, but, you know, once God starts opening up their eyes, they can never, ever turn back. I had to take my car to the Honda dealership. I left a copy of my book, Written Grace, on the passenger seat with a note that says, Honda guy, this book is for you. God bless. A few hours later, when I went to pick up the car, I'd forgotten all about the book. And and as I was leaving, the service man came running out and he said, oh, I, I forgot to tell you. Your technician said, thank you. And then I remember I said, oh, oh, for the book. And he said, yes. He said, I read the back of your book. I found it really interesting. By chance, could I have one as well? (laughs) <laughs> so we had a book giveaway right there at the service desk and talked a little bit about God. One last thing, we would like to see fruit produced through your efforts. And we're here to help. You saw that I took two of my favorite Bible passages and I made a presentation based on those passages for the Mormon people. We would like to help you do the same thing with your favorite passages. You see, we were a hundred years total, 40 years together in the Mormon church so that God could prepare us for this ministry. We would love to take your favorite passage and contrast it 
with a few Mormon doctrines or scriptures or principles or quotes so that you can contrast these with your Mormon friends and help them see the beauty of our God. Hey, it's been great to share this with you today. We would love to come to your church, so please contact us, reach out to us. We will come to you wherever you are and share the good, good news of our good, good God.